Hello everyone and welcome to the Advanced Microservices Workshop. My name is Kozlowski Florin. I am Senior Backend Developer at Multiverse X. And in today's presentation, we will take a closer look at how to build advanced microservices in Multiverse X ecosystem. The structure of the presentation is the following. First, I will be talking about the context of the presentation in which I will be explaining the examples and what we are trying to achieve here, how to interact with the smart contract, then we will deep dive into more advanced concepts like transaction processor, caching, why and how to use it, cache warmer, and at the end we will take a look at the code itself. The context of the presentation is the following. We have a ping pong microservice and we have a ping pong smart contract which is deployed somewhere on the blockchain. With the ping pong smart contract we can do the following things. We can send a ping transaction to it containing a certain amount of e-gold, after which we need to wait some time, 180 seconds. At the end of this waiting time, we can send a pong transaction to the smart contract, which will send back to us the initial deposit sent using ping. So we can ping some e-gold to the smart contract, and after we can pong the smart contract to send to us back the e-gold. We also can send time to pong to the smart contract, which once we pinged the smart contract, it will tell us how many seconds we need to wait until we can pong again. So we can ping the smart contract, after which from time to time we can send time to pong. When time to pong is zero, that means that we can now pong. And when we pong, we will get back the funds. The microservice will have four main endpoints, ping, pong endpoints, both of them will return back to the user a transaction that can be put in a um, wallet and signed, and, uh, the mark, and this way you can interact with a smart contract. Time to pong endpoint, <clears throat> which when called, it communicates directly with the smart, with the smart contract, you don't have to take the transaction and put it in a web wallet in order to execute it. The microservice communicates directly with the smart contract and a statistics endpoint, which again communicates directly with the smart contract and uh, retrieves a set of statistics about the, the smart contract itself. So we have the ping and pong um, endpoints, which will return a transaction back that you can use in your web wallet to sign and you can sign it and you can send it, send it to the smart contract and you have the time to pong endpoint which communicates directly with the smart contract. Now we will see a bit later why we have uh, time to pong which communicates directly with the smart contract and ping and pong which you need to uh, execute by hand. Let's focus a bit on the interaction between the microservice and the smart contract. How, how is this happening? How the microservice actually communicates with the smart contract. We have a snippet of code here, which will explain how the microservice communicates with the smart contract. We developed over time a series of NPM packages, uh, which will help us have a smoother interaction with the smart contract. In our case, we will be using SDK Core and SDK Network Provider NPM packages. The first thing that we need to do is to initiate a network provider. A network provider specifies, through the network provider we specify what is the gateway that we will be using. In our case will be API URL, will be devnetapi.multiverse6.com because that's our gateway and we will be communicating with it because we want to work with devnet. On the second part of the code, we have the registration of the smart contract itself. We have the ABI, we have the contract address, and we can initiate a smart contract object. Smart contract object that will return back to us a JavaScript object containing all the methods callable on the smart contract. So from this point onwards, you don't have to worry about creating the transaction yourself. So the first and second step can be considered as setup steps. The business logic is on the last step, the third step, in which we want to have an interaction with the smart contract and we're just saying call get time to pong on this contract 
with my address as a parameter, the wallet address, get the query for this interaction, and send this query through the network provider. So we are using the contract object that we previously created to create the query for what we want, and we are sending it through network provider to the blockchain. And we use results parser in order to parse the results. So the first two steps are only the setup steps and the business logic is here. And you don't have to worry about um, creating the transactions yourself. So this is how the microservice communicates with the smart contract itself. Now, it will be useful that the microservice, if the microservice will be able to react also to ping and pong transactions. But remember, ping and pong transactions are not created by the microservice itself. It, they are created by a web wallet. And how do we make a link between the microservice and other transactions that are happening on a blockchain? This is where transaction processor comes into play. Transaction processor is a NestJS service that we provided and we built, which scans the blockchain and receives batch of transactions through which you can iterate and you can filter only the transactions that you're interested in and you can call business logic once you found the transaction that, um, that you're interested in. Transaction processor being an SGS service, it can be inserted in any of your NSGS applications or as, our, our, as stated in our example, it can be a standalone microservice. So we communicate, transaction processor communicates with our API instance, instances through Redis pub sub transporter. Transaction processor iterates through the transactions it finds something that is of interest for us and it communicates to all of the API instances that it found something or only to some API instance that is responsible for some data or for specific transactions and that API instance can react to it. But if you are using transaction processor inside your API, then you can call business logic from within your transaction processor in your API and you don't need to use Redis Transporter in order to notify all your API instances. So transaction processor is the one that fills this gap. So now having a transaction processor inside your microservice or having a, tra a standalone transaction processor that notifies the microservice when a transaction is happening or executed, it means that now our microservice can react to other transactions, not only the ones that uh, it was created that was created by the microservice itself. Now let's take a look at how to work with a transaction processor. Transaction processor is available through SDK transaction processor npm package. You just have to initiate it. After you initiate it, you need to call the start method on the uh, initiated object which needs to be called periodically, depends how often you need to scan the blockchain. Alongside with other parameters that are sent to the start uh, method, you send also a callback, which is on transactions received, that is executed every time a batch of transaction is received. So you get the transactions here, alongside with shard nonce and statistics. You can iterate through them and in our ping pong case, we are interested only in the transactions that have as receiver our ping pong smart contract because we are interested only in our smart contract. And we want to know only about the transactions that were only about the ping or the pong transactions. So if the function name of the transaction is either ping or pong, then we want to do something. Either we uh, call some business logic here, either we notify the API. So this is what's happening here and how the gap is filled between the smart contract, the transactions that are happening in the blockchain and the microservice itself. Now let's talk about a bit, a bit about the caching. 
Why do we need caching? Well, querying the blockchain can be expensive, mean, meaning that it can take a lot of time to, uh, to get a response. And things on, block, on blockchain are changing only every six seconds. So if you already queried something on the blockchain, for six seconds, that query will be the same. Depends on which six seconds interval you uh, you run the query, because maybe there are three seconds, two seconds, four seconds, but maximum of six, six seconds. So it only makes sense to have a caching layer between the microservice and the call, calling of the blockchain itself, which will save the data of the initial call into cache. And second time, when the same call comes in, the response will be returned from, from caching. Of course, the caching is set with a TTL, so it will be expired. Now, in order to do this, we have developed an, another NSGS service, which is called Cache Service, available through SDK NSGS Cache. Our service has a two-layer cache. It has a layer one in-memory cache, a layer two Redis cache, and the layer to Redis cache. How is it working? When you want to get something from cache, first it will ask in-memory cache if the, the data is there. If not, it will ask Redis. If not, it will return null or, or undefined. Now, you, you need to keep in mind that this is a key value storage. That means that for every query that you want to do, every get that you want to do, you have to provide a key. That key will represent the value that you want to get from the caching itself. And alongside with those um, general get, set, and delete methods, we also provide some more complex methods like get or set. Meaning that on get on set or set, you can specify, you need to specify actually a key and some business logic to be executed the method. That means that if the key is not found in memory and is, not, is also not found in Redis, the logic will be executed and the returned value of this logic will be set in both Redis and in memory and returned to you. So get or set, cache, uh, cache works uh, in the following way. Let's say that you have a query that you want to uh, use and execute and you have a specific key for that query and it will never change. So when you write, when you call get or set, first it will check for in-memory cache. If the data is found, it will be returned from in-memory, which is much faster than Redis cache. If it's not found in memory, it will go on a remote Redis server and it will ask, do you have this key? If not, if, if it has this key, it will also be set in in-memory cache and returned. If it's not found in Redis, the method provided uh, to the get or set method will be executed. When the data is received from the method, the data will be set for this key in Redis and in memory and returned to as a response. So next time when you will ask for this key, it will be returned from in-memory or Redis. So this is uh, an example of what the caching service is, is doing. Now let's, let's talk about a, bit, a bit about the code. So we have the SDK and SGS package. We have the cache service. Let's say that we, we are inside an SGS class and we have injected cache service. So in order to set a value in cache, in both in, um, in memory and Redis, we need to call the set method with the cache key, the value, and an expiration time. We can also set uh, the value only in memory or only on remote or uh, specifying TTL also for uh, in memory or separate one for remote. So it's, uh, you can configure it how, how, however you want. And after that, we can get the value using the same key. So I, this will search in memory and in Redis and then return it for from whenever it is found. 
Now, the getter set can be also looked at as a wrapping mechanism. So you have a method, in our case, do something, and we want to cache that method. And we have a key attached to this execution of the method, and we, we are saying the following. Get or set this cache key. So if it is not, if it is found, it will be returned. If it's not found, then it, this will be executed and cache will be set in both in memory and reads. And we have a TTL. So this is how our caching service works. And this is how you increase the performance of your, of your application. Now, not every method needs to be cached. So please be aware of the things that you're caching and, um, Please be aware of how, how you use the caching service. Okay, so now we know what the transaction processor is. We know how to improve the performance of our application. What can we do further? Well, we can further improve the performance of our application because we have a special case here. So as you can see, we have a DTL for our cache. So let's say that we have a TTL of 10 seconds. That means that once I did the request for 10 seconds after um, I did the request, if another request comes in, it will be returned from cache. But after 11 seconds, the data will not be available in cache anymore and you have to execute this again. Now, there is a way <coughs> to keep in cache always up to date some things and fetch them behind the scenes. And this is where cache warmer comes into play. Cache warmer is a standalone microservice that fetches public data like tokens, right? From, from the blockchain itself. It fetches them periodically. It sets them into the Redis cache and notifies through Redis transporter every other API instance to delete the values from in-memory cache. Why? Because cache warmer is a standalone application. It does, does not have access to all the in-memory cache uh, instances from all the API applications. Because if you have multiple instances of your API on multiple servers, multiple servers, you will have an instance of in-memory cache for each one of them. They are not synced. It is not a central um, storage like Redis. So we need to purge the cache keys from in-memory and they will be refreshed from Redis. So what's happening, cache warmer works behind the scenes. It fetches some, some data, sets the data in Redis, and tells every API instance to delete the keys related to the data, to delete the in-memory keys related to the data. So each application will delete the keys from in-memory. And when a request comes in, it will be looking at in-memory first and will say, okay, I don't have this in-memory. Let me ask Redis. Redis, there is a single source of truth. So it will be fetching the new value set by cache warmer and will be also set in memory. So by resetting the in-memory cache, the in-memory will refetch the new value. So this can be used only for general data that uh, is the same for every request, but it's really helpful because it takes a lot of load uh, away from your application. So you can have an instance of an application that fetches data and sends, sets them to Redis and tells all the other applications or instances of API to delete the data from in-memory. So now we know what a transaction processor is, how the caching service is working that we'll be using, and what is a cache warmer. And now it's time to take a look at the code. I have prepared a setup. So here we have cloned the ping pong microservice, which is a with monorepo architecture, having API cache warmer and transaction processor microservices. And we have an instance of, of a terminal for each one of them. Only API being started. We also have a Redis instance in case we need to look at it. 
we will be using the swagger of the API. In order to interact with the API, you need a better authorization token. You can generate one in utils.multiparsex.com. Now let's try to time to pong the contract, send the request. As you can see, we get not yet pinged, which is okay because we didn't ping the contract yet. But before we get further, I want to show you that we have three different implementations of the same endpoints because we wanted to highlight it, the possible uh, approaches that you might take when you want to implement something. So the first one is the raw implementation in which you have to create your own VM query and your own transaction. This is where you create your own VM query and you create your own, you build your own transactions with ABI in which you use the constructor that I presented in uh, in the presentation and ABI with cache that we will be using in order to highlight the caching service, transaction processor and cache former. So when we call ABI with cache, if we look at the implementation, we see that this method is called get time to pong and the actual call to the smart contract is cached for one minute. That means that now the, the return value is returned from cache, not yet being this return from cache. Now, in order to make the microservice react to our ping transaction, we need to start the transaction processor. If you look at transaction processor, we can start it. And while it starts, I will show to you the implementation. So we have the callback through which you receive the transactions and you can filter the transactions. And in our case, when a ping or pong transaction is detected, we delete this key from cache, which is the same key that API is using. And we broadcast a message through PubSub for all the API instances to delete this key. That means that now this value is cached, but if we, let me connect to the wallet. If we send the transaction to the contract, the contract address is here. Okay, we send one eagled, say ping. Okay, the transaction is being processed. The transaction is completed and we will wait for transaction processor to get that transaction. You can see that ping pong transaction detected, which is here. And it deleted the um, key from cache and it broadcasted the message to all APIs. And if we look at the API, we got the message delete, deleting local cache key. So now, if we get time to pong, we get a number. It's not cached anymore. I mean, it was cached, deleted, and now it's cached again. Now we get a different number each time because we get the date delta. Before we highlight the pong transaction, I want to show to you how cache former works. And we have the stats endpoint, which communicates directly with the smart contract, and if we look at the cache former, what cache former is doing behind the scenes, it calls ping pong stats and it invalidates the keys, meaning that it will set the values in cache and it will broadcast a message to all APIs in order to delete this key. So it will be refreshed again. So in order to highlight this, now if I call it this endpoint is also, also cached. I've called it few times, so that means that this value is cached. So if we look at Redis, we have this key, and if we get the value, we have those numbers, right? The exact one that we are getting in the API. And if we start the cache former, those numbers will be updated behind the scenes in Redis because it will fetch from time to time 
and it will replace the values in radius. Now you can see that we have a cron job every 5 minutes, let's say every 10 seconds. Okay, let's start it again. Okay, so now we wait 10 seconds and the data will be fetched again. It's already fetched. And if we look in Redis, nothing happened because the statistics are the same. Not a ping or a pong transaction happened meanwhile. So if we look at time to pong now, we still have 17 seconds. So when time to pong will be zero, we can send a pong transaction and after 10 seconds, the data will be automatically updated in Redis and you can fetch it from your API without calling the API because cache former will fetch it for you. Time to Pong is zero, that means that we can send a Pong transaction. We can take the smart contract address from here. And we say Pong. Now, the transaction was processed. The previous value for statistics for Pong was 581, right? 581. And now the cache warmer is working behind the scenes. And if we look in Redis, we have 582 because cache warmer fetched the data for us, put it in cache, and notified all the API instances to delete the cache from local. And now, whenever we call ping pong, uh, ping pong statistics, we will get the values from cache. And this is how transaction processor is working. It all also de detected the pong transaction and deleted the cache. And this is how cache warmer is working to get things behind the scenes and set it in cache for you. That was all from my side. Thank you for your attention and have a good day.